great. Why don't we get started? Um, so welcome to our, uh, our next Our Ladies event. This is the introduction to network analysis. Um, again, if you need any of the materials, please go to this GitHub link. Um, and again, we'll, we posted the slides into the chat and I believe we'll be posting the markdown file in the chat um, as well. And please install these three packages if you haven't already. That's what we'll be using in this workshop. So for those of you kind of new to our ladies, hello, welcome. Um, this is a worldwide organization with the mission of promoting gender diversity in the R community. So it was started in 2012 and now has 193 chapters with more than 77,000 members globally, um, which is super, super cool. Um, this picture was taken, I believe, at one of our first events. Um, do you guys remember when you could like gather in crowds like that? It was so great. Um, yeah, if you want to learn more about Our Ladies, you can check it out at ourladies.org. Um, so the St. Louis chapter was started in to, uh, 2017 by Janine Harris and Chelsea West. Um, we had several meetups kind of in those academic years, um, and they've kind of been growing, which has been really fun to be a part of. Um, for this season, there are four co-organizers. So Janine Harris is one of them at Wash U. She is on this call, so that's fun. Um, Mary Painter at UMSL, who is also on this call. My name is Shelly, hello. Um, and Crystal Lewis from UMSL, who I don't believe is able to make it tonight. Um, so previously this fall, we talked about kind of cleaning up messy data. Um, we talked about visualizing data with ggplot. Today we're talking about network analyses. Um, and in December, our talk will be on an introduction to shiny, uh, making shiny apps. Uh, which is really, really cool. Um, we kind of organized this through Meetup. So I think most of you uh, signed up for this through the Meetup link. So be sure to check that out. Um, we also have a Twitter account you can follow if you'd like. Um, again, we'll be recording this. So feel free to turn off your cameras if you don't want to be recorded. Um, and you can use the chat to ask questions to like directly to a person or just in general if you're getting lost. Um, if you want to learn more or get involved, please visit the rladies.org website, um, or you can email us at rladiesstl at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter or on um, Meetup or whatever. Um, if you have ideas like maybe you want to present a workshop um, or you want to get more on the organizing side, we are happy to have all the help. Tonight is should be really fun and exciting. Um, Maria has a PhD in sociology from Duke. And she's currently a research fellow at Duke Network Analysis Center. And she's currently working on projects to employ network science to understand HIV prevention, social, uh, social ecological systems, collaborations within organizations, and networks of beliefs and mental models. So please join me in welcoming her today. And I will let Maria take over the sharing. All right, are you able to see my screen? Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for uh, such a warm introduction. I'm very happy to be here, feel very privileged to share with you some tools for network analysis. Uh, so the first thing we are going to do before we start is make sure you have installed the following packages um, that we have and also um, make sure that you have downloaded the materials that we are going to be working on. So to do that, you would go to the GitHub page. Um, I think we have that one in the chat. No, I'm going to uh, try to see can, how I can. Okay. So if you follow that link, it will take you to this page. And the easiest way I think to download the materials would be to go to this part of the page that is the red and uh, the green button code. So click on there and download zip. I think that would be the easiest way. And so what will happen is you get the materials in a, in a zip file. You can open it in your downloads folder. And so when you open it in the downloads folder, you are going to see there all of the materials. 
Um, the most important thing is to download and open this intro to nets script because this is the file that is going to have all of the um, code that we are going to be using today. So, so it's, it's very important that you have that file in there and that's the file that you can use to install the packages in case you have not done so yet. So, so please do that. Now in the GitHub page, um, in the downloads folder, make sure that the file that you open is this one that is a script that is called the script not the slides one, they are going to look very similar, but the one that you want to use is the script one. And for accessing, okay, so in the in the folder, also in the downloads folder, you are going to be uh, to see some sheet sheets. And these are going to be uh, cheat sheets that we are going to use for the plotting parameters and for color palettes. And we are going to be using these when we work in the network visualization part of the workshop. So uh, make sure also you, you see those files when you download the materials for the workshop, okay? So the next thing uh, you might want to do is also have access to the slides. So I'm going to copy and paste the, the link to the slides in case you want to follow them. So here it is in the chat, all right? So those are the things that we want to make sure we have taken care of before we start the workshop. Okay, so uh, this workshop is going to be divided in several sections and after each of the sections, we are going to have some hands-on activities and I, I will also be answering questions. So feel free to make your like put your questions in the chat in the meantime but i'll be addressing the questions uh, every time that we have a break or a transition to an activity okay so to get started i want to introduce you to the topic and look at an overview of what we're dealing with and what network analysis is so that you have a solid conceptual foundation um, before we start coding and doing the analysis so network analysis is, is a set of tools that is going to help us to map and understand complex systems and structures. And this is an important task because uh, we often cannot assess the pattern of connections in big systems only based on our intuition. We might think that we have an understanding of the system, but unless we can see the big picture, it is sometimes very difficult to get a good idea of what's going on. Now, network analysis really focuses on relational methods. So wherever we have relations, that's when we are going to use network analysis. And here we are usually very interested in seeing the connections between things, the structures and the positions. So to, uh, for it to be network analysis, we really need data that has entities and the relationships between entities. Now, this might sound very abstract, so I'm going to show you some of the applications that we have in network analysis so that you have a clearer idea of what type of things you can do with these techniques. Okay, so here's the first application. Um, this is COVID-19. And so in this, this is a very cool project that does simulations um, about what would happen uh, for the virus to be transmitted in different circumstances. So what we have here is the nodes are colored in green. And so each green dot is going to represent a household. Now, the blue dots are going to represent households that have people who are essential workers within the household. So you see that the, that the, um, that the blue dots are in, in, in less proportion than the green dots. And what you see in the gray lines, these gray links, are going to be contacts or interactions between members of different households. And so what you see here is that just by the fact of having essential workers being outside of, of, of the house and having interactions with people who are from different households, we already see uh, some of the uh, probability of the virus being spreading that is higher than zero. So you see that, that the structure of the network already 
creates a pattern in which the virus can be spread more quickly and reach to more people. So that's a cool application and you can click in here to see what would happen in different scenarios and how the virus is transmitted if, for example, you visit only one friend per household. So this is a very cool application. This is another application about political polarization. And what you see here is the entities in this graph are um, Senate senators. So here the links that are connecting different senators are the similarity in the voting, um, voting for different bills. And what you see in the big, big circles, in the big uh, dots, is coalitions. So it's, it's clusters of senators that tend to vote in a very similar way. And what the graph is showing that is that over time, the coalitions become bigger and they become more, more polarized, um, bringing people, more people to the coalitions so that you get a much more polarized uh, picture of the of Senate voting. So this is another very cool application here. The entities are the senators and the links are based on voting similarity. Here we have another application. This is based on the connectome and is based on the relationships between different regions on the brain and their functional connections. And this is a very important topic because it has been discovered that for certain brain malfunctions, they are really related to some important part of the network losing its connection uh, with other parts of the network. So it really has, network analysis really has many cool applications. Another cool application is the food web. So here, what we have is that the circles, every node is going to be given by an ingredient and the connections between ingredients are going to be given um, by uh, sharing the number of flavor compounds that they share. So here you see that different, different cultures have different sets of ingredients and sets of flavor combinations. So this has been used to create not only to understand cultural differences in the way we eat, but also to come up with new ideas of recipes that could work based on this pattern of relationships and the flavor compounds that different ingredients share. So you see that really network analysis has very varied applications. It's everywhere. Everywhere where you have entities connected by relations, you will see that network analysis it can be appropriate and can shed light on important things and, and give you important ideas that you can work with for different goals. Okay, so in today's workshop, we are going to be working with a couple of data sets and we are going to be looking at the relationships between entities. We are going to be looking at the pattern of relationships as a whole. And we are going to also be identifying clear and key um, people that are in the network, like key players. And we are also going to be identifying subgroups in the net network. So this is what we are going to be doing today. So now, if you can go, please go to our studio and open the file, um, the, the script file in our markdown. So we are going to get started with a little bit of coding to introduce you to the basic concepts. What we're going to do is just run, run the first lines of the code. These packages, what we are going to do with them is this uh, package is going to give us the data, the data set. And this package, iGraph, is one of the most widely used packages for network analysis. There are other ones, but this is the one that we are going to be using. This package APE, we are going to be talking uh, about it at the very in the very last part of the workshop, and it's going to be letting us do community detection. So once we have loaded the packages and installed the packages, we can access the data. And you can see that the data is already in our global environment. The next thing we are going to do is just some graphics set up, and we're, we are just going to do um, Create the margins. And the MC, can I interrupt for just a second? We can see your slides, but not your code right now. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Sure. Okay. Are you able to see my slides? 
I say, Michael? I can see it, yes. Okay. So going back to, it, to the very beginning, we can, we can load, we start by loading the packages. So this is the first 15 lines of the code. We load the data and we see that it's now in our, our global environment. And the next thing we're going to do is just do a quick setup. The reason we want to do this setup is these are the default margins uh, for the plots to show. So we are going to have the default margins um, already saved as an object. And we are going to have also an object that has null margins. And we are going to do this because networks tend to occupy a bigger space in the, in the, in the plot frame. So if you want to look at your network and have a, a better visualization, it's better to use no margins because usually you have so many nodes and so many links between the, the entities that it's hard to see them. So you really want to have margins that are at zero for the network plots. But also when you are working with other types of plots that you usually do in R, you also want to have the default margins so that they are not cut. You, you can see the whole picture. Okay, so now we are going to set our plots um, screen to the no margins, no margins settings, and we are going to construct the plot. This, don't worry about this, this part of the, of the plot is only so that you can construct your plot quickly and see how this is going to work and where you can see your plot in the screen. We are going to be talking about these different parameters when we get to the visualization section, but this is just to show you that we begin by constructing our first plot that you have already made. So here you have your plot and that's how you will start all analysis by plotting your network. Now we have our plot, but we want to understand what are the basic elements of the plot and, and what are the basic features of the network. So I'm going to go back to my slides. I think you should be able to see the slides, right? Yeah, okay, so, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the basic network elements. Now, here in purple are all of our circles. They represent nodes and they are going to be the entities of the network. In the case of the network um, that we are looking at now, these are members of a karate club. So these are people, members of a karate club, and they are connected by the, the purple lines here are the links, or what are the relationships that connect the entities. And in this case, these are going to be friendships, okay? Now, in networks, we also have features like the direction of the network. So directed networks are, are going to have a direction in the relationships. So here, for example, you are going to see that node D connects to node C, but node C doesn't connect to node D. For example, if this was a friendship, this would mean that node D is friends with node C, but node C does not consider D a friend. So here you see that the, the relationship has a direction. It comes from one node to another node. In undirected networks, we don't have that direction. We only, the, the relationship is assumed to be reciprocal. So that if this was a friendship, we assume that M and H are friends and it's not like M is friends with H, but H is not friends with M. They are both friends and we just don't assume directionality. We can also talk about weights of a network. Um, in an unweighted network, the relationships are going to take the same value for all relationships, okay? So we see that they, they look the same. In a weighted network, their relationships are going to have different values. So for example, in the example of a friendship network, usually a stronger or higher values, stronger links or higher values are going to represent a stronger relationships. Yeah, so and usually we graph them so that thicker lines represent a stronger relationships or higher values. You can also think about this in the case of exchange network. 
And for example, the weight of the relationship could be the number of goodies that are exchanged or the number of relationships that, that the people have or the number of interactions that people have. So you can see how the relationships can take different values. So now let's take a look at our network. So if we go back to our R Studio file, we can start by looking at the most general characteristics of the network. Now, an important thing to note here is that I'm working with this iGraph package and I'm working already with, um, with an object that is already a network. So network packages only take as input objects that are networks. If you have a data frame or an object that is not a network, you can, there are different ways of constructing a network, but I'm not going to cover those in this workshop, but I'll give you materials of where to find, um, how to find the way of doing it based on other workshops and other materials. But for today, I'm going to start with a network object. So the way in which you can know if what type of object you have is by using the class function. And so that's gonna tell me that UK faculty, that is the data set we are using here, is an iGraph object or a network object, okay? So the UK faculty data set is a data set that is based on faculty in a UK university. Uh, we have 81 faculty members and they are represented by numbers. And we also have the links connecting people here are going to be based on friendships. So to explore the network, the first thing we are going to do is simply run a code that simply has the name of the object. And we are going, what we're going to obtain as a result is this output. So here we see that it's an iGraph object. And this here is going to tell us the basic characteristics of the network. So the D here is going to tell us that this is a directed network. So as you can see in the plot, there are arrows. And so it is a network where we have friendships that are direct. If this was an undirected network, we would have a U here. This is also a weighted network. And this means that the relationships have values. In here, I have not plotted yet the, the weights because the uh, plot would be too crowded, but that's something that we can do later on when we explore the visualization part. This is telling us that the network is composed of 81 nodes. And this is telling us that we have 817 relationships. Here tells us the basic characteristics of our object. Now, the next part that we are going to see here is the attributes of the network. And so we can have three types of attributes the attributes of the whole graph. So here you are going to see all of the ones that have the G and C. Here the day, the type and the citation are attributes of the whole network. Here, usually these are going to be things like a citation, like a citation, something that is very uninformative is more like at the network level. Here we have the author that compiled the network data. So it's really at the level of the network. Now, when we see these VN attributes, those are going to be attributes of the vertices or nodes. So nodes, vertices, those terms are interchangeable. And so here we see that group is one of the uh, attributes of the vertices. We are going to explore it in a little bit more of detail later on. And all of the attributes that have the E in there, it means that these are attributes of the edges or ties. So here edges, ties, or links are going to be terms that are used interchangeably. So here we see that weight, as we talked about, so here we have the weight. Weight is an attribute of the, of the edges. And what we're going to see next is a list of all of the edges that we have in the, in the network. So that's our first explanation, exploration of the network. The first, the very first thing that we are going to be doing. The next thing that we can 
um, figure out about the network is whether the graph has multiple edges per pair of nodes and whether the graph has any loops. Graph and network here, I'm using the terms interchangeably too. Loops are going to be connections between the same node. So if 48, let's say, is connected, things that it has, it, it's friends with itself, or himself, herself, then we would see a loop here. And so the way to figure out whether we have any multiple edges or any loops is to use this uh, function if simple. So if we run this, we are going to see that is true. Simple graphs or simple networks are going to be those that don't have multiple edges or any loops. Now, this is important to do because if you have loops or if you have multiple edges, sometimes you are going to try to select on which edges you want to focus on and you want to remove usually loops for the next part of the analysis. And we are going to see like how to, how to do that in a minute. But this is important because it really will tell you uh, which type of edges you have and whether you have loops and that could be, that would have implications for the type of analysis that you are doing. All right, so with this said, uh, we are going to do a little activity. So here we are going to just explore the Karate network. That was the network I was uh, looking at at the very beginning. And so the task here is to figure out how many nodes the network has whether the network is directed or undirected and what vertex and edge attributes the network has. So I, here I gave you just the code for you to explore it and, and, figure, and figure it out. And we are just going to take a couple minutes for doing this. In this at this point, I am also going to take questions. Hey Maria, we have a question in the chat um, about can R handle big a big data network? Yeah, yeah, it can. It can. Um, sometimes it will be. I think the I think the limit was something like one hundred thousand nodes, and then it starts becoming slow. And it also so it can handle it, but it it also depends on what you want to do. So if you are going to do something very statistically intensive, like models, statistical models, things like that, or simulations, then is is the network size will really hurt you. But in general, for these basic descriptive things, it really can handle big data. Okay, so. Um, another question that I, I think I saw in the, in the chat uh, was whether here, when we see list of 10, whether 10 is a representation of the attributes. And the answer to that is of the number of attributes. And the answer to that is, is no. A, all network objects in iGraph will, um, will, will be stored as a list of 10. But the type of object that these that they are going to be is uh, the class is going to be iGraph or network, depending on the object that on the uh, package that you use. The list of ten is going to be um, storing different aspects of the network, but it's not it's not a representation of the number of attributes. To really know the number of attributes, 
these are going to be these are going to be stored in here. So here you would see the number of attributes for the for the vertices is going to be one, two, three, four, four. So it is not a representation of that. Yeah. Hey Maria, we can't see your uh, your code. <laughs> you have it on your slide. <laughs> there you go. There we go. So yeah. So the way to see uh, the number of attributes is to explore the data. Yeah, you see. And so then you see the number of attributes per edge, vertices, or at the level of the network. OK. Um, hey, Maria, we have a question. Uh, yeah. One of the participants is getting an error about degree. Couldn't find a function called degree. Yeah, uh, that usually would be a function of not having the package, the packages installed and loaded. So make sure that you have run uh, these lines from A to 15. And if, if you have installed the packages and they, are and they are loaded and you keep getting the error, please let me know. And be sure if you haven't installed the packages before you remove the, the hashtag sign before mm -hmm. the code. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Okay. So here we see the solutions. We see this karate club network. Uh, we see that it's undirected, weighted. It has 34 uh, nodes, 78 edges. And we have like the, the, all of the attributes. So we are going to be exploring them in more detail in the next session. And we see that it's a simple network. So we can take a closer inspection. And to do this, we are going to go back to our RStudio code. So taking a closer look, the first thing that we can do is take a look at the attributes of the network. And here we are going to be exploring the three types of attributes that we have at the network level, the vertex level, so vertices, and at the edge level. So if we look at the graph attributes or the attributes of the network, here we have the authors, the citation, the date of creation, and the type. I'm not really sure what this type of this type means. Uh, but it's certainly, if you look into the documentation of the network, it, I'm sure it will tell you what it means. But for our purposes, it's not really relevant. Then we can look at the vertex attributes. So one way to really quickly look at which vertex attributes we have is by running this piece of code, vertex attributes. And here we are going to see that the only attribute that we have is group, it's called group. And it means it's, it's about which group um, the nodes belong to. So group here, to give you some context, is about the, the schools to which different faculty members belong. Now, here to access anything that has to do with the vertices, we are going to use this V, capital V, and eight of the net. So this is going to refer to the vertices of the network or nodes or the... If we we're going to do something akin to a head, what we do to explore the head of a data frame, we would do this. This is the way to index or access the vertex attributes. And here we are going to see that we see the um, attributes for the first five nodes. Yeah. You can also access an, the, an attribute and see the whole values, the entire set of values for an attribute. If you use, again, the vertices um, indexing function, and then you use the dollar sign and then the name of the of the attribute. And if you run this, you are going to see the whole set of values for that for that for that attribute. And you can also mix this, this with uh, functions from the R base package from R base. And so if you can create a table of the attributes, and we see that we really have four groups. So 33. 33 uh, faculty members belong to group one, 27 to two, 19 to three, and two to four. 
Now, looking into edge attributes. To know which edge attributes we have, it's very similar to what we have done before. We run this function edge.attributes, and we are going to see the different attributes that we have. Now, here the, 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 list, um, the size is bigger because we have many more nodes than in the Karate Club data, uh, but here we see the weight. Here we see the weight. And in the head is the same. We can look at a head of the, of the edges. Here, instead of having a V, we have an E for accessing the edges data. And what we see here is the, the different attributes and characteristics of the edges for the five first observations. So here we have tail and head are going to tell you from where it is the edge is directed and to where the edge is directed. And here we are going to work with IDs. So tail and head and TID and head ID would be different if we had names and numeric IDs for the, for the vertices. But here we, our IDs and names are the same. So these do not differ for that reason. But essentially what this is capturing here would be the names of the nodes from which and to which then the edge is directed and the numeric IDs. And we also have the weight attribute in here for the first five, first five observations. We can also look at the whole uh, weight. So that we can see in here, these are the different weights. We can also combine this with R base and get a summary of the different weights. So the maximum weight is 16. Again, this is the, this is the uh, strength of the relationship between faculty members. And we can also construct a histogram of the different weights and seeing that most people really, the weights are very little, but for some people, the strength of the relationship is very, is, is a very strong relationship. We can also explore different uh, specific elements of the, of the vertices um, of the network. So if we went, want to look vertices, this uh, command, so the V and the name of the network is going to give us the whole set of vertices. And we can also look at a specific vertices. So for example, let's uh, pretend that we want to know which people, which faculty members are connected to node one, to faculty member one. So here we can use the, the function neighbors and that's going to give us the set of nodes that are connected to, mo to node one. This function you can have in the mode parameter, you can have different values that are going to give uh, you different types of ties. So because this is a directed network, you can look at the outgoing ties. So the ties that stem from node one towards other nodes, you can get the incoming ties that are going to be ties that come from other nodes to node one. And you can do a combination of all ties that are, and this is going to include ties that stem from node one to other vertices and ties that go from other vertices to node one. So this is a good way to get uh, the specific connections of a specific node. You can also use this uh, to filter and look at which nodes have more than Mm, one connection, one, more than one, more than different numbers of connections and different kinds of, which nodes meet different kinds of conditions. So here this function degree is going to give you the number of connections uh, for, the, for the different nodes in the network. And so we can combine this with the indexing of V and the name of the network to tell R to tell us, okay, how, what are the nodes that have less than 10 connections. And if we run this, we are going to see this is the set of nodes that have less than 10 connections. So this is a good way to explore your data and to get access to the different elements. Now, when it comes to edges, we can also get a very specific elements. We can explore whether a given edge exists. So for example, in this case, we want to figure out whether there is an edge, a tie between the nodes one and two. 
And so this is the code that is going to allow us to do this. So if we run this, we are going to see a zero. And in weighted networks, we see the weight of the, of the ties. So zero means the, there is not a relationship between these two nodes. And in unweighted networks, we are going to see a true or a false, depending on whether there is a connection or not. Now, we can also see, for example, in the case where there exists a connection, if we run this piece of code, we are going to see the weight that that edge, edge, um, that that edge takes. Um, and, but keep in mind that in directed networks, the place in which you put the node names here or the node um, IDs here is going to is going to give you different results for from and to. So if you want the node the no, the edge that goes from node one to node forty four, you want to start with node one and then put node forty four. But if you want the edge that goes from forty four to one, then you want to go you want to put node forty four first. And we can see that it's a different tie that has weight six. You can also look at edges between a specific nodes. So this is very similar. If you put here the, the, the signs and, and the two lines, this is another way to get at which are the edges between the specific nodes. Now, if we do this, with, uh, with these two symbols in here, this is going to give us which edges are between these two nodes, regardless of the direction. So you see that is a different way to get at the same type of information, but we can disregard the direction. Now you can also use this utilizing the direction of the edge. So in here, if you put um, the minus less than um, symbol, you are going to get the edge that goes from 44 to one. Yeah, and so you can get the edge. But if you want this to be from one to 44, you are going to use the greater than sign to indicate the direction. So here we have the edge from one to 44. You can also use these tools to get at the, at the edges that uh, come from or go to a specific vertex. So for example, in this case, UK faculty, you can, you can use the two. And that means that this is going to give us all of, this is going to give us all of the edges that go to node one. And so you can here see the edges. And you can also see all of the edges that stem from node one, if you run this piece of code. So here you can see we get all of the edges that stem from node one. Okay, so now we are going to um, take a closer look at the Karate network, and this is going to be an exercise for you. So we are going to begin by looking again at the Karate network, and here we have the different uh, um, attributes if you want to look at them to guide you. But what we are going to do now is replace in every piece of code where you see this in the following pieces of code, we are going to replace it um, by, the, by, the, um, by the thing that will give us the answer to each of the questions, okay? And we are going to take a few minutes to do this. I'll also be answering questions in the chat. Hey, Maria, we have a question. It is, uh, what is a faction? Yeah, a faction in the case of the, of the Karate data um, means the groups that they, they belong to. So it's, um, it's a story, the, this Karate Club data um, is a, is, has two structures and at one moment in the, in the evolution of the, of the, of the club, they became two different factions and they actually became two different clubs. So that's what the faction attribute means 
but it can it really can take the attributes can take any name the name um tells you something about the network but it could have been any name um Okay, so are there any other questions? Okay, I'll keep moving forward. And if there are any questions, please may, feel free to put them in the, in the chat. You should be able to see my screen, right? Yes. Okay, so here are some solutions uh, to the to the exercises. I'm not going to go through those in detail, but I just know that you have them in the slides in case that you want to check your work. So you can just look at the slides. One thing to note here based on the question too is that the attributes of the vertices can be really anything. So sometimes in here in the two examples that I have put forth here, these have been groups or factions, but these can really be anything. So for example, in some networks, the attributes of the vertices can be their gender or their age or the level of education or, or some other feature of the vertices. It can be any feature of the different vertices. And same with the edges. So this right now it has been the, the attribute per excellence is weight but and weight usually means something about the value of the relationship so whether the strength of the relationship whether the relationship is strong or not but it can be also the type of relationship any feature that is inherent to the relationship okay so let's go into network visualization and this this should be very cool so Network visualization, how this works is this usually works via algorithms. So these algorithms, what they try to do is they try to reduce the crossing of the edges and they try to keep the edge length as constant as possible so that you have a, a visually appealing uh, product. So this works um, with the plot parameter a plot function and we are going to be looking this into more detail but I just want to point out to you with these tables that you also have in the cheat sheets for the workshop the different parameters and different things that you can change at the level of the nodes or the vertices you can change the color the shape the size the labels that you have the type of font whether the font of the label is bold italic different things you can change the size of the font and the distance of the label from the, from the nodes. You can also change things about the edges. 
So you can also change how the links are colored, what type of line you use them to represent, you use to represent them, the width, oops, oh, the width that you are using, the type of label that you have for the edges, the family, the font, the size. So it's very similar to the nodes parameters. You can also uh, look at the curvature. So sometimes you will see that the, that the tile will look curved and sometimes no. And sometimes you can also, you can also um, change the size of the arrow. So these are different floating things just so that you keep in mind what kind of things you can change. Now, to change these parameters and to construct your plot, you have two different options. The first option is to set the visual properties outside of the plot function. And what is going to happen here is that you saw that we could access different attributes of the vertices and different attributes of the edges. We, we already learned how to access them. Now we can assign them, assign them a color, for example, in the case of color, or a value if we are talking about the, the size of the label. So here we can create an attribute and assign them to assign the attribute to a certain value and then use the plot function with these attributes. Now in the second option, we can use the function arguments of the plot function and use the arguments to set the colors and different things that we want. So we are going to look at this into more detail, but I want to show you how you can do these things in two different ways. And that is going to be important because if you can access the vertices and assign them to a different value, you can see that just as we subset, subset and look at the specific nodes, the specific edges, we can also assign certain values of the, of the visual properties to subset of nodes, to subset of edges, and then plot them in the, in the plot function. And that would be very hard to do or harder to do if you are just using the plot function and using the function argument. So, so you have these two possibilities and depending on your goal, you want to use one or the other or usually more often a combination of the two. But we are going to look into this. It's going to make more sense as we go into the code. So as I, as I was saying, you use the setting of the visual properties outside the plot function when you want to assign different visual properties to different subsets of vertices or different subsets of edges. But if you want to assign a global visual property that is going to um, work for every vertex and every edge of the network, then you are going to want to assign a global visual property inside the plot function. Most often than not, though, we are going to combine the two because most of, more often than not, we have subsets of, of nodes and edges having different properties, but we also have global properties that we have, we want to have for the entire network. So let's go to the code and let's try this. So if we go back to the code, the first thing we're going to do is set the wider margins and Let's say for the UK faculty, the first plot, basic plot that we are going to get is going to look like this. If we don't do anything to the network before we do, we tinker with it, the first type of plot is going to look somewhere, somewhat like this. And so what we are going to do is first uh, do the, the first type of settings, so setting the visual properties outside of the plot function. So we want to create an attribute that is called color. And this could, be, this could be any name of a color. So here I'm using this color because it's the, it's the color for the art ladies um, image. But you can put here something like green, blue, is going to work the same. So if we, do, if we run the, the, the code, it's going to assign this color as an attribute to the vertices. You can also uh, use the label color and the label, the, um, the font, the size of the font. And you can also use properties to the edges. Yeah, 
So if once you do that, once you have assigned these properties, if you run a plot of the network, you are going to see those properties realized in the plot. Now, the important thing here is that the name of the attribute has to match with the name of the visual property. So if I, I put here something like v that color, it wouldn't work. It has to match the name of the property. Now, the second way of plotting the, the network is to assign the properties, the visual properties directly into the plot function. So here you would start with plot, the name of the network. And here I have assigned different properties depending on the vertex, the label, or the edge. So I'm going to go a little fast on this. We are going to look into more into the different ways of, um, you have the, the, the different parameters that you can think of, but let's say I have changed here different properties of the vertices. Here I am changing different properties of the labels, the color, the, the size of the, of the label, the family. And I'm also changing some of the edge properties. So if I run this piece of code, I'm going to get um, a plot of the network that has these properties. Okay, so you can use this now to uh, assign different properties to subsets of the, of the network. So here, for example, we had looked into the different groups we have in the network and we can assign those colors, different colors to different groups in the network. So here I have done that. I create different colors. Um, I create different labels for the labs. And what I'm going to do is assign the different colors that I have, the different colors that I have created to the, to the vertices as a color attribute, different colors as a frame, as a color of the frame for different groups and different colors for the different labels because white, black, and white, black, because uh, different colors, white or black are going to look better in depending on the type of, of color that I have. So if I do this, now I, I, I see that different groups are going to have different colors. You see, so this is a way to subset, to assign different colors to different places of the network, to different groups. So you can also combine both options. So before we had assigned different colors to the different groups, but you can also keep adding inside the plot function different parameters to keep changing your plot. So now we see that the arrows are pretty big and the, and the, and the labels are in Times New Roman, but we can change that. And the nodes also seem pretty big, so we can tune, keep tuning within the plot function. And we see that we can change now the plot. We can also color specific edges, not just a specific nodes. So let's say we are going to assign a color for all of the edges that is going to be the color gray. But let's say that we want only for the, for the edge that goes from 47 to 28, the edges that connect these two nodes, we, we want to assign them the color of the art ladies. So what we're going to see here is that if we only assign this color to this specific edge, now we plot the network and we see here, if I zoom in, I'm going to see here that nodes 47 and 28 are now connected with a purple edge. So this is going to be useful if you want to highlight a specific edges, a specific nodes, a specific elements of your plot. So with this, um, we are going to try this. And so I would like you to play a little bit with the, with the different um, parameters and create a plot for the karate data. So you would start by saying plot, karate, and then you would start using different parameters. And what I would do 
um, is go to the cheat sheets and use the color palette to use the colors that you would like to use and also the plotting parameters cheat sheet so that you can see which different options you can change and play with this. So this is the activity that we are going to do. And in the meantime, I also take questions. No, I, I was not speaking, but I'm speaking right now. Are you able to hear me, J.H.? Uh, a question asks, if I get a different plot visually, do the plot always change every time we run it? Yes, it does. It does change um, every time you run it, but I, I can show you a way to keep the layout the same. I can show you that in a minute. In the meantime, uh, what are some of my favorite colors or properties for visualization? Uh, colors, I always look, I really like the, the cheat sheet that I sent to you that is in the, in the material. I really like to combine colors from that one and in the, at the very end, it has like the different palettes that you can use. So usually I try to use the palettes that you have uh, because usually the palettes have colors a set of colors that is visually pleasing and so those are the those are the colors that i try to use for properties for visualization it depends on what you want to highlight uh, if you want to highlight say the communities or the subgroups in the network then coloring the nodes is the way to go if you want to highlight the different um, values of relationships, of the strength of the relationships, then it is better to highlight the weights by assigning different thickness of, of lines to different weights. 
if, for example, you want to highlight different types of relationships, so for example, you would say that one subgroup in the network is only family ties, but another subgroup in the network is only friendship ties, you may may want you might uh, want want to assign different types of lines to those different groups. So it really depends on on what it has. The visualization has to highlight what you want to highlight for the argument that you want to make or for the property that you want to explore. So other than that, uh, the algorithms do a pretty good job in, in making the network visually pleasing by, um, by minimizing the crossing of edges and minimizing the differences in the length of the ties. Yeah, so that's what I would say.
Okay, so I hope you've had a lot of fun um, doing the plots. I always love network visualization. There are many more things um, that we can explore with that, but I'll, I'll, at the end of the workshop, you're going to see a list of resources with the best tutorial I have seen for network visualization. So I hope that anything that we couldn't cover today, you, you, you will have something more to explore at the end of the workshop. Now, I quickly, before we go into a break, I want to show you before we finish this part of network visualization, I want to show you the way of keeping the layout um, still. So what will happen is you will see that every time that you run the algorithm, it's going to give you a slightly different results. So the positioning of the network is going to change. But so what you can do is create an object. We are going to call it L. And to that object, we assign the layout that we are going to use. So there are different layouts and the layouts is going to go, is, is beyond the scope of this workshop. Um, but again, in the tutorial that I'm going to share with you at the end, they cover this. So if this is something that interests you, you will see it at, at the end. So, but for now I'm going to just pick layout nicely. That is the algorithm that I usually use. And we are going to place here the name of the network. So we just assign to this layout to the object L. And so now uh, if we plot faculty, if we plot the network, uh, and we lay out it with L, the layout is going to stay the same no matter how many times I run it. And so this is a useful trick. If you want to plot networks over time, for example, and keep the same layout to see the changes, um, that's, a good, that's a good way to keep the layout the same. So with that said, I hope you had a lot of fun plotting the networks. And now I'm going to um, give us a little break and for five minutes to take some time to stretch, you know, take a walk, a quick walk. <laughs> To do something fun. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm also going to take questions if there are any.
Okay, so time to go back. Okay, so now we're gonna get into descriptive statistics. So for descriptive statistics, we are going to start explaining to you a little bit of the conceptual part of this, and then we are going to play again with the data. So the first um, descriptive statistics that we have for networks is the density. And this is just the proportion of the edges that we see in the network out of all possible edges. So this is gonna tell us how connected is the network overall. Now with density, you want to be careful because as you can imagine, if the network is incrementing its size, if we have a very big network, then it's really not feasible that all of the nodes have many, many connections just by the nature of the connections. Maybe they are cumbersome, maybe it's not easy to have so, so many friends. So you want to take density with a little bit of caution because if you have very big networks, the density is going to be very, very low, not necessarily because the network is not well connected, but just because of the size. Now, reciprocity. In reciprocity, we usually talk about reciprocity for directed networks. And here we have two types. The first type is the number of reciprocal edges over the total number of edges. And here a reciprocal edge is an edge in which if A in a node um, has a connection with B, B also claims to have a connection with A. So you see that the, the directionality goes both ways. That's a reciprocal edge. So you can get a first indication if you run it um, through the number of, of reciprocal edges over the total number of edges. But you can also get another indication if you take the number of reciprocal edges over the number of dyads with only one unreciprocated edge. So you usually would take um, the second type if you have a network that is bigger in size because then the total number of edges is probably um, less good of an indication of, of the reciprocity. Reciprocity in general is an indication of the connectivity of the network and the trust and bonding between the individuals or entities that are in the network. You can also take a dyad census. So a dyad census is a, is a census of the types of dyads that you see in the network. A dyad is simply a pair of vertices. So in directed graphs, when the graph is directed, you can have three types of dyads. The first type of dyad is a null dyad. So in this kind of dyad, there would be no edge between the pair of vertices. You can also get an asymmetric dyad in which you, want, you have one directed edge, but it's not reciprocated. And you also can have a mutual diet. So in here you will have two directed edges. Now, by calculating how many types of, uh, how many edges you have that are asymmetric or mutual or null, you can have an indication of the hierarchical structure. structure. Because if you have many asymmetric types, it means that there's no reciprocation and many people tend to nominate somebody that is not reciprocating. So that gives you an idea of a hierarchy. Transitivity is also known as the clustering coefficient. And this, um, this is the fraction of, of transitive triplets. So triplets are going to be combinations of three nodes. So here to visualize this, this is a transitive triplet. It, it means that when you have an A and an edge from A to B and an edge from B to C, you will also have an edge from A to C. And this is our representation of the, of the property, a friend of a friend is a friend. So if you see this transitive triplet, it means that, the, that usually with transitive um, networks, you will see that uh, the uh, you have a most more closely needed network. So the relationships are more bonding here. In an intransitive triplet, if you have an edge from A to B and an edge from B to C, then you don't have an edge from A to C. And th so that makes it intransitive. The property, a friend of a friend is a friend, is not, is not, is not a property that you see in this triplet. We can also think about reachability or, or how reachable are the nodes in the network. And the classical measure of this is the average path length. 
Now, a path is the series of steps that are going to connect a node with another node. So for example, in this case, if you want to know which is the path connecting D and A, you will go from D to C, from C to B, and from B to A, and that would be the path. Now, you can get all of the paths connecting all of the pairs of nodes in the network and calculate the average number of steps, and that's going to give you the average path length. And that's going to tell you, on average, how many people, how many steps do I have to take in order to connect two nodes in the network. You can also get the diameter. That's another measure of reachability, and that's going to tell you the nodes that are farthest apart, those that are farthest away, how many steps do we need to take to connect those nodes? And so this is going to give you also a good measure of how reachable are the nodes in your network. So for example, here, the nodes that are farthest apart are A and E. So here you see the diameter goes from E to G to C to B to A. Now, here the diameter and the average path length are taking into account the directionality of the network. But you can also calculate this ignoring the directionality and just treating this as um, undirected um, edges. That's something that you can do with the, with the software. Another indication indicator that you can calculate is the presence of connected components. Now, what is a component? A component is a subset of the network that where uh, everyone is connected somehow. So for example, in this example here, we have two components. We have one component here and one component here. So these are going to be the components of the network because these are subsets that are connected. Now, we talk about strongly connected components when um, everyone in the network is reachable. So here we see that. But we talk about a weakly connected component. If you follow uh, the paths in the network, taking into account the direction, you cannot get to every node from every other node. So for example, you cannot get here from B to D because there's no, no, no edge from B to C and no edge from C to D. The direction here is taken into account. So you cannot get from B to D, and that makes this component a weakly connected component. We can also talk about articulation points. These articulation points are nodes that, if removed, would break the network into more components. And so these are indicators of the vulnerability of the network. So for example, take node B and node C. If you were to remove node B or node C, so say node B, then you would break the network into one component having, having nodes D, C, E, and G, and another component with an isolate node of A. Take, for example, if you remove C from the network, then you would also uh, break the network into smaller components. So those are our articulation points. Now, let's go to the code. And let's see if we can try this and see what we get. So to do this, we're going to go down to the section of descriptive network statistics. This is in line 367. And so here are the functions that are going to allow us to, to calculate these different things. So in the case of the UK faculty network, we can get the density, that's 12. And so what this means, the interpretation of this is we have 12.6% of the possible edges realized. So out of all the possible no, uh, edges that we can have, 12% of those are uh, edges that we have in the network. That, um, in general, that's a, that for the number of nodes that we have is a, is a good um, density. It's, is a dense graph. Now, how you interpret density and these measures really depends on the application and what is the usual density, reciprocity, et cetera, that you observe in the type of network that you are dealing with. Because you can imagine that if you are dealing with airports or people or proteins or, or a food web or ingredients, the, the amount of connections that you will have will differ because the process by which these things are related 
is different. We can also calculate reciprocity here. Now, the default for reciprocity is to calculate um, the number of reciprocal edges out of the total possible edges. And so we see here that the reciprocity is 58%. So 58% of the edges are reciprocal. And that's almost 59. That's a big, big number. So we, what we can conclude is that this network has a lot of trust, a lot of bonding, because the, the ties are reciprocal. We can also get the diet census, and that is going to tell us the number of edges that are mutual, asymmetrical, and null. We see a good proportion of, of edges that are asymmetrical, but we also see a very good proportion of edges that are mutual. This is equivalent. If we take this over the total number of edges, this is going to be um, equivalent to the reciprocity. We can also get the transitivity. And so here we have 47, 47, 47 uh, percent of the triplets are closed triplets. So again, this is a high number. So we see that this is a closely, is a, a needed network, is a closed network. Reachability. So here we have that on average, it takes 2.5 steps to reach every pair, um, to reach nodes, and to reach every pair of nodes in the network. That, that's, a small, that's a small number. The diameter is 35. And here we are taking out the weights, um, but you can also calculate this with the weights. And so the weights, mm -hmm. if you calculate it with weights, it's going to take the weights as a measure of distance. So it's going to, more weights are, are, are going to be farther away. So um, the stronger weights would mean that, they, that there's more distance between people. But we don't want to really um, know this in terms of weights, we would rather just keep it simple, so we remove the weights. And we can, we can also get an idea of which are the farthest, the farthest vertices in the network. And so the farthest vertices in the network are going to be the vertices 18 and 73. And if you take this distance with this with the distance taking into account the weights, these two are going to be taking into account the weights 22 steps away. You can also get the connected components. So if you ask, um, ask the, the ask R, if this component here, we just have a giant component here, we just have a, a very big component here. If this is a strong component, is not a strong component because not every node is reachable to every other node if we follow only the direct paths. And we can also get an idea of the articulation points. And in here, we don't have any node that if removed would, um, would break the network into a smaller parts. So that's a very good sign of no vulnerabilities in the network. This is a strongly connected network, is a, a network that is dense and has high reciprocity and high transitivity. All right. So now uh, I would like you to take a turn and obtain the following descriptive statistics for the karate data. So we have density, transitivity, and I'm, I have them here. So that you can see the so that you can see how to which functions you would use to calculate these measures for the karate data. Uh, so we are going to take five minutes to do this, and I'm going to also answer questions in the chat. Uh, somebody asked, how do we use the relationship to run a regression model? So regression models is a more advanced topic. Um, at the end of the workshop, I have a list of resources and some of them contain resources for including these in regression models, but that definitely falls out of the scope of this one. For now, we're just looking into basic descriptive statistics. Thank you for the question.
Um, so another question reads, any rule to say reciprocity or diet census or transitivity is high or low? Uh, not really. There are no good benchmarks that I know of because it's really dependent on the type of problem that you are working on. If you are working on a friendship network, that is very different than a collaboration network or a network that have entities, uh, a network that has entities that are different from people. So it really, um, you really want to look into previous studies of networks that have used data that are similar to the one that you are using to know how your um, statistics, statistics compare to those. So that's, that's what I would say. It's really dependent. Yeah, so the question is maybe we could compare to some random networks. Uh, and the answer is yes, you could do that, but sometimes it's difficult to, to say what is a random network. So there are different definitions of random. So some people use completely at random where the probability of, of every edge is the same, but other in other applications you see random, but with the same degree distribution. So uh, with the same, you know, like where we keep constant the number of, of nodes that have this, this number of edges and so on. And so depending on the problem that we are working on, the definition of what is random and what type of randomness you should calculate is different. So, but that's definitely an approach that you, you can take. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slides and I'm going to skip the solutions for now just for the sake of time. But again, all of the solutions for this are in the, in the slides so you can look at them. Now I want to discuss a little bit centrality and community detection. And these are the last two topics. Um, so yeah, so let's go through this. Uh, first of all, again, with a, we are going to begin with a conceptual overview of centrality to give you an idea of conceptually where we are, what we are trying to look into. So centrality, uh, what we want to identify with this is key players. And now key players in a network is difficult to define this. So there are different definitions and you really want to think about what is the process that is going on in your network so that you can select more appropriately which of the different measures that I'm going to present to you is the one that you should use. So, we are going, there are many, really many different measures of centrality, but here I'm going to just cover three of them that are the most wide, widely used. So degree centrality. Degree centrality is just the number of ties that a node has. We talk about in degree centrality if we only calculate the, uh, the ties that are incoming to a node. And we also use out degree centrality when we refer to the ties that are outgoing that come from a node, but go to other nodes. Now, we can also have another measure that is closeness centrality. This is based on the distance to all other nodes and is going to be based on the, on the average paths. Here, geodesic is another way of saying shortest paths. So this is going to take the shortest paths between a node and all other nodes and it's going to calculate the inverse of that. And that's going to give us an idea of how close each node is to every other node in the network. Between the centrality is based on the brokerage, brokerage, brokerage position. So if closeness centrality is based on distances to all other nodes, 
Here between us is going to be based on how much of a brokerage of bridging bridges that are probably would not be otherwise connected. How much bridging am I doing with my node? And this is going to be based on the number of shortest paths that pass through the node. So to illustrate this, um, I'm going to show you a, a figure, but what we want to take out, take away from this discussion is that we really want to pick the measure that is, give us, is going to give us what we are interested in conceptually. And for, to do this, we are going to distinguish between local versus global patterns. So take, for example, this network. If we calculate degree, we would see that node two, four, and three, they each have an out degree of three and a total degree of four. But we see that node one, it takes a brokerage, brokerage, brokerage position because it's taking the bridging position in the shortest paths that connect different nodes in the network. So if you only take degree centrality, node two, three, and four are going to be uh, highly central, but you see that really, if you are interested in brokerage, you should pick node number one. So if, no, if you are interested in bridging positions, you want to use between the centrality or closeness. Closeness is going to calculate the distance between each node and all of the other nodes in the network. But if you are more interested in local patterns, so which nodes are locally central, then you would probably want to use degree centrality. So depending on the problem you are interested in, you want to use different types of, of measures. Now, we can try this out in our code. So we go to our studio and we go into, um, into the line 399 degree centrality. And here we can just use um, the different functions that we have for degree. I'm going to give you some code here if you want to calculate the distribution, the distribution of degree centrality, so of degree. So you can see here how many nodes have each um, number of three degrees. And you can calculate this for in degree, out degree. You can also calculate it for all degrees. So another thing that you can do is plot the network taking into account the degree of the nodes. So to do this, you assign an object deck that contains the degree of the network of each, um, each node in the network. And you are going to assign just as we did before an attribute that is going to contain that degree. And you want to plot the, the size of the vertices as the degree. Now, this is a very common problem that we have, um, that if you only do this and leave it like that, you will get nodes that are extremely, extremely uh, high in degree. And what is going to happen is that they are going to override and like um, overcome the whole plot. So one trick to plot the degree, and that's going to be very important to, so that you can look at differences in your nodes is to just to take the square root of the degree so that you can um, you can visualize them and add a, a constant depending on how the, the graph turns out to be. And this is going to give you a better picture. Now, you want to still um, take measures that are numeric so that you can get a good comparison. But for the purposes of um, plotting this, you can use the square root. We can also arrange the nodes by degree. And uh, what we can see here is that we are going to get two, two, two objects if we use this, function, with this argument index return. We get a first, a first, um, a first uh, set with the degrees from highest to lowest. And we also get the position. So node 29 is the one that has degrees of 62 and so on. We can also just color the five most central nodes, keeping the sizes um, constant. 
and I'm going to go a little bit more quickly now because of uh, for the sake of time but I want you to know that you have the code to do this in case you want to explore it more deeply we can also do exactly the same as we did with degree with closeness. So the function to calculate closeness is going to be closeness. We can obtain the centralization of closeness. And this is going to give us this number here. The centralization is going to give us, uh, it ranges from zero to one and is telling us how much of the central total centrality in the network is, um, is, is um, in one single node. We can also do the same thing where we sort the nodes based on their closeness centrality. And we can also color the more five most central nodes according to closeness centrality. We can repeat the exact same procedure with between the centrality. So we can, we can calculate is the same thing. Centralization is going to give us how much of the centrality is concentrated in one single node. We can sort by betweenness and we can plot the five most central nodes. Now, out of this, we can see that the five most central nodes are usually um, the same, but depending on the type of network and the type of structure, you can see differences depending on the type of centrality measure that you use. And that's going to be important. Now, just for the sake of time, because we have very few minutes, um, I'm going to skip this, this exercise, but you have the slides and the code and you definitely can try this on your own. And we are going to just cover the last topic that is community detection. Um, so let's get to it. This should be very quick. I also left the solutions here. And for community detection, what we are trying to do here is we want to find cohesive groups, cohesive subgroups within the network. There are many different ways of doing this and different algorithms, um, but a good way to do it or a widely used way to do it is to maximize modularity. So the algorithms that we are going to use are going to try to maximize this quantity called modularity that tell us that there are more intra-community edges than one would expect at random. Again, we run into the problem of what a random network would be in this case, but the general idea, what we are trying to do is to find groups that have more edges between the nodes of that group than the edges that are uh, from within the group to the outside between groups. So that's what we are trying to do. Now the algorithms again are going to try to use modularity, modularity and what we want to do is uh, use undirected and non-weighted data because otherwise it gets very complicated pretty fast. So most applications use undirected and non-weighted data for this. After we use the community detection procedure, we always want to look into the characteristics of the different communities to see if there's something that holds them together. So for example, you can see that different communities um, have different types of relationships or belong to different departments, to different schools. There has to be some substantive um, thing that holds them together. So you always want to analyze this, okay? So that you can correctly interpret the communities. And we can just uh, start by converting the, the network into a non-directed graph so that we don't we can run this uh, with an undirected and unweighted um, unweighted um, graph and the algorithm that we are going to use is the algorithm fast grid so this is the community detection procedure we are going to run something that we want to take into account is that we use there are different algorithms but we use fast greedy because uh, we want this to not be computationally expensive but other algorithms and depending on how many nodes you have can take a good amount of time so you want to be careful with this the next thing we can see is that if we explore the object we created we can see that this is a community object we can see how many communities we have by using the, the function length what are the sizes of those communities so we see we have 19 nodes in one 
uh, and six in, in the fifth community. And we can also see the final modularity that we obtained. Now, modularity approaches one, the more um, cohesive the subgroups are, the more modular they are. And 56 is a, is a good number, usually in the range of 40, 46, depending, again, depends on the application, but usually 40, we um, tend to understand that the modularity is high. If we use this, uh, this case that is our object of communities as an argument of the plot, we will get a visualization of the different communities we have, we have uh, found. And we can also use the uh, dendrogram plot. And what this plot is telling us is which nodes were assigned to which partition very quickly. So here you can see how different nodes were assigned to different partitions. Now you can, uh, we already did the visualization, so you can always improve the plot and I leave this for you to explore. But basically what we are doing is instead of having the maps, um, the maps using the default algorithm, what we are doing is coloring the, the different communities by, um, with the colors that we decide to use. And so you can do that. And I, it's not very important, so I'm not going deep into it, but I, I can give you this possibility so that when you construct your own plots, you can mm, tailor them to what you would like to do. And so with this, uh, we are just going to do the last exercise and conclude the workshop. Um, so because we don't have really, we're out of time, I, you can do the, the, the exercise on your own. Um, and I leave the solution here so that you can see the communities. Now to conclude, I want to talk a little bit about what to do with this workshop, how to use this workshop or where to go from here. So now that you know some of the measures that you can take, you can use these measures to answer key questions about your own data. Thinking about your own data, you can take networks and in, as independent variables. And so this would be if you have a non-network outcome. So for example, are people whose friends suffer from some disease more likely to have the disease themselves? This is based on an, uh, net, an outcome that is non-network and you use the network variables to understand that outcome. You can also use centrality measures to see if central actors have access maybe to more resources or to some outcome. You can also use networks as dependent variables. This would be more advanced, but here what you are trying to see is what causes the patterns you see in the network. How did the network come to be? How structurally cohesive is that given network? So you can also think about different mechanisms of action to understand your network and to see which measures you should calculate. So if you think of a connectionist point of view, you see networks as pipes and the outcome results from what is flowing in the network. So examples of this are the spread of a virus, the sharing of information, things like that. And you can also think about positions. So the outcome results from the positions and the roles that the nodes occupy. So for example, you can see the popularity effects or how um, centrality affects something. So these are two ways of thinking that I think would be good for you to know so that you can start thinking about how to use these network analysis ideas and tools. You can also use the network embeddedness. So it's how, how within the network um, and know this. So these are just some ideas of how to use the tools that we have explored today. As I said, uh, there are more resources this is, these are tutorials for network visualization in the Duke Network Analysis Center. You will find many tutorials for more advanced topics and also data cleaning, how to construct your network objects. There are really many things that you can explore in there. And these um, books that are really good for using network analysis with R. And with this, I conclude. Um, I would like, love to hear about your experience taking this workshop that will help me improve. So if you have some time and would like to help me, 
I would really appreciate if you can complete the survey that you can follow, um, that you can access if you follow the link in the slides. Uh, with that, I conclude the workshop and I'll take questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the, some of the questions are, how are the measures on closeness centrality affected by the number of nodes on a network? Either are they harder to identify if you have a smaller networks? So if you have, maybe they are harder to identify if you have um, bigger networks, depending on the, on the, on the application. Um, Usually, the, the measure that is most affected by the number of nodes and by which nodes specifically are in the network. So, for example, when you have problems where you didn't get all of the nodes in the network, where you couldn't sample really well, is between the centrality. That's the one that tends to suffer the most. Closeness centrality, not so much but between us because it relies on the shortest paths connecting, um, connecting different regions. That's the one that tends to be less reliable if you have problems with your data or, or depending on the size. And I think that's the only question, but I'm happy to answer more questions if, if they come up. You're just getting a lot of thanks in the chat. So I'll echo the thank you of all the participants. And um, on behalf of the organizers, we really appreciate your time. Uh, and we will um, post this, uh, a link to the recording of this session uh, on our Twitter feed if anybody wants to go back and take a look at it. So, uh, I'm very you. grateful for the invitation. And thank you so much for everyone who was this uh, for taking the time. Thank you. All right. I'm going to, oh, the survey, there's still a survey to do if you all have time. Uh, and if anybody wants an Our Lady St. Louis laptop sticker, just go ahead and send me your address. So other than that, I'm going to, I'll wait about another minute and then I'll close out the, uh, close out the window here. And thank you for sending the link to the survey. That's a good call. Yeah, thanks, Mary. <laughs> yeah. All righty. That, that'll do it. Thanks, MC. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye.